Hello, friends. Well, beautiful day here in Alabama. Looks like clouds are kind of coming in. It's beautiful temperatures here. Hope you're having a wonderful day. Friends, I'm going to do a video today about the coming of the Lord. And now I, I think there are some of you that probably think, well, what? You know, uh, let's get to some juicy stuff. Because what I want to talk about today is something that we should already know. But it's very sad that there are many, and it seems like they're coming out of the woodwork right now, that this message is going forth, that there really wasn't a real Jesus, or, and, and, or, He's not coming back again in actuality. He's just in your heart. And there are various versions of this. Now we have verses of the Bible that tell us it's not true. But it seems like there are some variations of these ideas that are going around that I guess people think, well, if it's a variation, it's not exactly what we were told not to believe then maybe it's it's true that this aspect or that and yeah we believe he's coming but just not he's not coming the way that we had always dreamed or he's not coming yet or we don't never know when he's coming maybe he never will or there's a peculiar teaching going around that Jesus already came and this is the one that I want to kind of focus on because it appears to be quite a few different individuals that are talking about this. They have this view, and this is why I did the video yesterday, and I did one a few days ago on this subject because I'm real worried about this because some of the dearest brothers and people that I love are now teaching this and um, so I wanted it, this is so important that we get this straight that we understand this it means our very life it really does and, and I'll explain why it's not because we're bad people because we don't understand the scriptures you don't always have to understand everything at first but what we have to have is a pure heart an open mind to go to the Lord and, the, and ask the Lord the truth. If we believe in the Lord, then why would we not go to the Lord? And if we don't really believe in the Lord enough to pray and to go unto the Lord and ask and wait for the truth, and then when we read the verses in the Bible and we see them clearly, we don't try to... I don't know what happens. I mean, it, it's the darndest thing that people will read very clear statements of doctrine and truth, but misunderstand them and find some obscure verse somewhere else that they don't understand and they think it means something that, that it doesn't and they'll just hang on to that. Like, well, this scripture says that Jesus isn't coming back or he already returned. And then they just, they believe in that even though you could show them a hundred verses that tells you that Jesus is coming back, but somehow their mind has come to a place where they don't see the verses clearly anymore. And I think sometimes people get caught up in the whole pursuit of finding verses that don't say what people thought they said. And it's like an, an adrenaline, like, oh, yay, I got a new truth and I'm going to tell the world, you know. Um, I think some people, when they watch my videos, think that's the way I am, that I'm just blatantly coming out with stuff that's opposite of what people had always believed. And a lot of people say, I like the way you think, Dave, you think out of the box. Well, you know, I don't know whether that's such a great attribute. I don't know that the one thing the Lord's looking for is somebody who thinks out of the box, right? I mean, I don't know really what that means. But what I do know is 
the reason that I do what I do, whatever I do, usually, I mean, I'm a human being and I make mistakes too, obviously. But I can tell you in my own heart, my own intention is that I'm looking for the truth. I have found that there are a lot of lies being told. And when I found truth, and it didn't agree with what people had already been saying, I did come out and tell the world. And I think a lot of people think, oh, well, that's the key then. We need to find things that nobody else believes and be contrary. Let's be a contrarian. Um, that's not what we should be doing. Now, let me start. I've got several verses of the Bible I want to read to you. I want to start with, First Thessalonians. I want to read verse 13 of First Thessalonians chapter 4. And it says this, But I would not ye to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. See, there's always these little words that we should probably look up every little word, make sure we know we're talking about. Is he really talking about sleeping? Well, I think most of us know that he's talking about the dead, right? The people who have died. But he says, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not. Well, I think actually Paul even says asleep in death a couple of times. So we know that it means to be asleep in death. And we can look at the context. But he says, don't be sorrowing. Because even as those which have no hope. Okay, so we have a hope. Now what would the hope, what, what good would hope do us? Well, because if we didn't have any hope, hope of what? That those who had died are going to come back, be alive. Then we would be sorrowful. You see, I know it sounds like we should have understood that verse when I just read it, but I'm, I'm, I'm making sure we, we get what we're talking about here. We're talking about people coming back and being raised from the dead, having life, not being dead, not being gone. Because if they were all gone, or maybe they went to hell, I don't know. This doesn't seem like it's talking about people believing that somebody went to hell. This sounds like people were worried that their loved ones had died and they weren't coming back. And verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and he rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will the Lord bring with him. Now, isn't it interesting? We could say, okay, yeah, I believe in the resurrection, but I don't think Jesus is coming back literally. Well, it's because we know that Jesus is coming back, because we know Jesus was raised from the dead. And what does that mean? Oh, well, he just went to heaven somewhere and he's in another realm and, and we'll never see him again. Jesus just, he didn't raise up the body because if he had a body, he'd live on the earth, right? He'd live on a, in a world where there were trees and mountains and land and flowers and, you know, he'd have hands and eyes and, and nose and, and, and be a, a person, right? Maybe we should read that verse where when Jesus was raised up, Thomas didn't believe. And, and in order to show Thomas that he was raised up, he said, touch me. A spirit doesn't have flesh and bones as you see that I do. And it says Thomas touched and felt where the nail holes had gone through. Now, a lot of people think that when Jesus is going to return, he's going to still have these nail holes. I don't think so. I'm sure that healed. <laughs> but Jesus had just been raised from the dead and he still had the nail holes or scars at least. And Thomas could feel and say, okay, yeah, you are not just a lookalike, but you're Jesus. You got, you can see that you've been crucified, but now you're alive. And you're not a spirit. You say, well, we don't know that's true. That's just what the Bible says. Well, you know, we're going by what the Bible says here. Okay, that'd be a whole nother uh, video on whether or not you believe in the Bible, right? We, we're, not, we're not talking about that today. We're assuming all of us here believe in the Bible. And the Bible says that Jesus said that he was not a spirit, a disembodied spirit, but he was a person and he had raised up his actual body, the one that wasn't crucified. So 
We don't have to look that verse up. I mean, I described it. But according to the Apostle Paul, there are those who have had people who died and they're sorrowful because their, their loved ones have died. And Paul was saying, if you believe in Paul, we believe in the Bible. He's saying, don't, don't be like that, like those who don't have any hope. Because if you believe that Jesus died and was raised from the dead, then you have to understand that when Jesus comes back, and he is coming, right? This is the idea that we, we were trying to we're, we're trying to show this today, that Jesus is coming back literally with the body that he raised up from the dead. That means that you could touch him just like Thomas did. You see, because what good would it do if you say, well, Jesus was a spirit. So all your loved ones are gone. They're spirits. They're wisps of air. They're flying around in the clouds somewhere. We don't, you know, they'll never come back and touch you and hold you and care for us and we'll never rejoice and frolic in the fields and have fun and, you know, I mean, we don't even know what spirit is. Like some kind of demon, right? Floating around trying to find a body to live in. That's not hope. And that's certainly not what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying that Jesus proved that he was risen. And this is our faith, that he died and rose again the third day. And he's coming again. And therefore, if he's coming again, the whole reason he died and was raised is to raise all of us up, his brethren. And we're, and he says he's going to bring the saints with him when he comes. So that's why it says, For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will divine one bring with him. Verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Okay, he's not saying we're going to say this just out of the, you know, ideas in our head running around through our little mind. Like, Peter's got an idea, and James has got an idea, and Paul has some ideas, and, and we're just telling you our ideas. Now, Peter says that. He says, we're not giving you some private interpretation. But he says, Peter says, I saw it with my own eyes on the Mount of Transfiguration. I know this is real. And Paul is saying, look, I met the Lord on the road to Damascus. I know that Jesus is alive. And he says, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, not by our word, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord. So the Lord is coming, but in what way? Well, huh, there are going to be people who will be alive on this earth who will see the Lord coming. Now, we know the Bible says that every eye will see the Lord. And we'll talk about that. But if they're dead and they're not on the earth anymore, of course, they're not going to see him. Well, well, yes, everyone will see him, even the dead, because he's bringing them back with him, right? When he comes, he's bringing them with him. But those who are alive on the earth, right? And this is a word from, from the Lord himself, Paul says. I'm, tell, I'm an apostle, I'm an apostle, and I'm, I'm an ambassador. I'm going to tell you the good news. This is the good news. Tell everybody this is the hope that we have that those who remain and are alive unto the coming of the Lord. Oh, he's coming. In reality, shall not prevent them which are asleep for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. So is does the Bible teach then? Well, in this verse it does, right? In this verse of scripture, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul teaches that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. What does that mean? It means come to the earth with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of the divine deity. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another. You see, if Jesus isn't really coming back, then maybe your loved ones are just gone. That's, that's sorrowful. But you want comfort? 
The comfort is that the apostles who saw the Lord and testified that he was risen from the dead, they are telling you, this is the scriptures that they wrote down and that for 2,000 years we've been reading and putting our faith in the message or the gospel. And that gospel is that Jesus himself will return and we will see him and our loved ones. Now, you say, okay, that's one verse, right? You got one verse, Dave. Okay, I'll show you some verses that says he's not coming. Hmm, okay. Can you show me that? Well, we'll get to a couple of verses here in a minute that people use. Um, so let's, let's, but first let's go to first John chapter three and verse one, behold, what manner of love the father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of the divine one. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Hmm, I mean, you could take any verse and you could twist any little sentence around and start making up ideas, right? That the world knew him not, then maybe this is just some private, you know, only a little group of Christians thought Jesus was alive and saw him and knew him and the rest of the world didn't see him because it didn't actually happen. It's all in their minds, right? Well, I hope we don't have to try and counter arguments like that here. Because that's not what this is trying to say. If you believe, like I said, we have already said that this video today is for those who believe in the Bible. Because I don't have time to prove that the Bible's true in this video. But if you believe in the Bible, then what is the, the real meaning behind the words? That's not what those words meant. What he's saying is, is that we know the Lord Jesus and we know that he really died and he rose from the dead. And there are people like Judeans who don't believe he's coming again. They didn't believe he was the Messiah. I'm sure there's lots of beliefs in the world because of the fact that they didn't want to believe or they were indoctrinated, right? They went off with their group and their group tried to brainwash them. But for all those who saw the Lord, they gave their testimony that Jesus was real. And those who heard the testimony and believed, even though they hadn't seen Jesus said, happy are those who believe and have not seen. Why? Because they believe based on the evidence of all the testimony that they were given. And, of course, that, that the Holy Spirit was poured out and they were doing miracles and things. So in down verse 2, Beloved, now we are the sons of the divine, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know because, you know, we're going to go with him somewhere. We only know that he raised up a body of flesh and bones. Now, remember, as we've said many times, he doesn't mention any blood. The body was raised up, but it was a little different. It was immortal now. An immortal body is different slightly than an, a mortal body because the mortality of this body is that it has blood. And if you cut yourself, you bleed out and you die. But Jesus can never die again. His body is now immortal. That's the difference. We don't really know then what we will be like, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, right? Because we're going to be changed. You remember that verse? It says, we're going to be changed in a twinkling of an eye and meet him in the air. The Bible is very consistent. For we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure all right now let's go to another verse revelation chapter 1 verse 6 and hath made us kings and priests unto god and his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever amen behold he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him. Who is, who is that? Those people in Jerusalem that said, may his blood be upon us and our children. Crucify him. 
Those are the ones who pierced him. And he says, He cometh with the clouds, and every eye will see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth, see, the Judeans and all the Gentiles, all the peoples of the world, all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Some people take that, verses like that, to be very esoteric and he's just talking about coming in some sort of strange way, right? In a spiritual sense. So I'm reading that one to show you the kinds of verses that people say are just not really literal. And we shouldn't take them literal because after all, it's in the book of Revelation. And yet, here in the book of Revelation, even the John in the book of Revelation says that everybody will see him, even those who have pierced him. Now, look at 1 Corinthians 15. Let's get that in context. All right. Verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? See, this is the gospel. We're hoping for what? To be a spirit flying around, a disembodied spirit like the demons, searching for a home, not being able to play and frolic in the grass and pick flowers and have families and eat nice meals and go walking in the mountains and build a home and live forever in peace and in a paradise. Isn't that what we're looking for? Otherwise, we wouldn't know. I mean, yeah, okay, maybe it could be something we just can't even imagine, right? But it's not on earth. We're just going to be spirits somewhere. Well, but that's not what the Bible's teaching because the reason we have hope is we know that we're going to have life, an abundant life, and we're going to be able to have enjoyment with our families. And, and we have this hope because of the gospel. And the gospel says that Jesus rose again. He rose his body from the grave. He was crucified and rose the third day. That's the basis of our hope. So the Apostle Paul here in 1 Corinthians 15 is saying, how are some of you saying then there is no resurrection? That it's only we're going to go to heaven. We're going to be spirits. But when the body's not coming back. Because if there's no resurrection or the raising up of the body from the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain? And your faith is also vain. Ye and we are found false witnesses of the divine because we have testified of the deity that he raised up Christ whom he raised not up. See, they testified. They made a testimony. That's what this whole thing is. The new covenant in Christ. And the covenant is for a kingdom, that we shall be with the Lord. Jesus sat there and says, drink, this is my body. I'm going to die for you. I'm going to die and I'm going to go to hell. I'm going to conquer the devil who's got the keys of death. And I'm going to conquer him. I'm going to come up out of there and I'm going to be alive and raise up my body in three days. And that's the basis of our hope. And if the dead does not rise, then Christ is not raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. In verse 18, Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men, of all men, most miserable. Verse 20, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. Oh, so there's a coming. He's going to come and receive us unto himself. And we're going to see him as he is. And the Lord himself will come with a shout. And the dead in Christ will rise first. 
Then come at the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of the divine one, even the Father, when he shall put down all rule and all authority and power. He must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So, then he, it, you know, there's all kinds of, it keeps on going and going and going about how he's trying to prove to us that there is a resurrection. And then he talks about the different glories and and as, as we've said, this is a very interesting verse because he talks about being sown in weakness as a physical body, a mortal body, and we're going to be raised up an immortal body, put on immortality. Now, let's go to Ephesians. Now, here is one of these verses that I have been shown recently that evidently, I guess, there are some who are saying that this proves that Jesus already came. And we're not looking forward to him coming anymore. But whatever Jesus did for us, it's already been done. His kingdom was established. Every eye saw it back in those days. Now, you know, a lot of us have forgotten and the devil's running around trying to deceive everybody again, I guess. I don't really know how they understand that. But they claim that Jesus already came in 70 AD in the desert. Even though Jesus said, if some say I came already in the desert, don't believe them. Because when I come, every eye will see. And the dead will be raised. And all of this. And the kingdom of righteousness. And the new heavens and the new earth. And we've shown verses yesterday that basically touch on all of this as well. But here's, here's the, the verse. Go down to verse 5. And it says, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. Oh, so this resurrection is not really the bodily resurrection. They're saying it's just a quickening or a making alive. All right? We used to be dead in sin because we were physical. But now we're quickened already. We're already quickened together with Christ. Where's Christ? You don't see Christ, do you, anywhere? You see Christ? I don't see Christ. Jesus is somewhere in heaven or something. And we're with him. We're already there. In verse 6, well, together with Christ, by grace are ye saved. And verse 6, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Jesus Christ, or in Christ Jesus. So we're already, you, you could you could add the word already, and hath already raised us up together, and hath already made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that's all it's talking about. It's not talking about any actual coming of the Lord in the end of time, setting up his kingdom, and raising people from the dead in a real, literal sense that the body will come back. But it's just flying around as spirits, like the demons without a home. Bible says right there, and there's no way to get around it, right? That he's already raised us up together with him, and he's already set us in the heavenly places. So we're already reigning with Christ. His, 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 his thousand year reign, that's symbolic. It's not a thousand years, right? It won't be exactly a thousand years. It'll be a thousand, maybe that represents forever. What, is it, what about the end of the thousand years when the dead comes up back up and there's another judgment and Gog and Magog, the spirits of the dead come out and, you know, have the great war and, and there's a last judgment. Right? At the end of the thousand years. Well, we don't know what that means. It's all esoteric. Okay. Well, what do we do with that verse? Let me show you. So, what does it mean? What words are we, are we looking at here? And he raised us up together. So we've already been raised up, right? Let's look at that word. To raise together, I raise along with. Hmm. Boy, this ain't looking good, does it? <laughs> All right, so it's from the word son, which is with, together. All right, we know that one. And egero. All right, 
Egero. Egero. Definition, to waken. Hmm, and the second is to rise up. Well, that makes some sense. So it doesn't really mean to be raised up. It's not the same word as the resurrection. It's a word to be awakened. To arouse. Hmm. In Greek writings from Homer, to arouse from sleep. To arouse from the sleep of death. To recall the dead to life. Well, now, <laughs> we have to understand that some of these words are esoteric. And in, 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 we, as we've seen, there are those who are asleep in death. And in order to wake up, or in order to be raised up from the dead, they got to be awakened from the dead. And so there certainly are verses in the Bible... I mean, we have some verses that just say we're going to be, have a resurrection of the body. And that's a literal sense. But then there are those that talk about an esoteric sleeping, which is literally death. And an esoteric awakening, which means that we're in a death-like state, even though we're not physically dead, but we're walking around in a death-like state. And if we awaken mentally and emotionally and you know, with our mental faculties, we, we have an awareness, a conscious awareness. We're no longer sleeping in a death-like condition. But this is a spiritual, these are spiritual words, and they're not to be understood as literal. Because, in other words, they may be literal words, to be awakened. That's a, rigid, a, a, a literal word. But we can see with the context there, that he's not talking about literally raising up physically but it's just a kind of an esoteric awakening so let's go back and look at that again and he hath awakened us up together okay does he mean that the resurrection's already taken place no but wait a minute and seated us together in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus Hmm, let's take a look at that word. To make, to sit together. To sit together. So this is son, which is together with. We looked at that word right here. Right, this is with, together. And then the other word is kathizo. What is that one? All right, definition to make sit down. To sit down. Um... Another form of kathizomai. To sit down. I'm sitting down. And it's from kata and the base of hedreos. To sit down. Hedreos. Sitting, seated, steadfast or firm. Drive from a seat or a base, properly steadfast, firm, morally fixed, in purpose, in mind, well stationed, securely positioned, not given to fluctuation or moving off course. You see, this word isn't literally to sit down. It is a word that means to be firmly and steadfast and settled. Look at this. Over here, to have fixed one's abode, to settle down. So you have an abode. It didn't even necessarily mean to sit exactly, but to be settled in your abode. Now if we go back and we look at that word, both of them together. It says, He hath aroused us together and settled us so that we're firm in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So, are we actually... 
see, you have to understand, we're never going to be raised up in heaven in a spirit, as a spirit. Because always when people die, their spirits ascend. But that's not what the resurrection is. The resurrection is the resurrection of the body. And the Bible teaches that the body is going to be raised up. And it means to be raised, the body raised. And there's verses that say we're going to have the body raised. But this isn't talking about the raising up of the body to go sit in a spiritual place where there is no body. This is talking about the heavenly realms in Christ that are higher realms of thought. And we're going to be in this higher consciousness because of the hope that Jesus gave us and because of the purity and, and the love and his grace. He raised us up together with him in heavenly places so that we're now firm in the love of Christ. We're not talking about the resurrection here. So I think this is really probably not translated that well. And the divine one hath raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms. But even though it's probably, it, it, they probably should have translated it aroused our minds up with Christ and settled us in the heavenly places with Christ. Even the way it's written, though, I think most most people who believe in the resurrection understand that's what it means. But there are those, though, that want to pick apart a verse, not knowing the exact meaning of each of these words. It seems to me that there's an, a motive behind people who cannot see that there is a resurrection or they can't see that Jesus is real. Do, I don't know what it is that that's where they usually go to. They gravitate to trying to find verses in the Bible that actually teach. Like, I don't even know why they'd use the Bible. If they didn't believe in Jesus, why would they even believe in the Bible? Like, if, if, if their mind is going to gravitate away from the hope of Christ, if they're, obviously they're being led by the spirit of confusion. Now, I'm not saying we can, we might not, any of us at any time being led, you know, the devil comes to all of us and whispers in our ear and we, we get confused sometimes. And, you know, we're not, we're not praying enough properly or sincerely enough or whatever. Maybe our mind or our heart is, is weakening and we need to find an excuse for our desire not to believe in Jesus anymore. So we're going and looking for verses that we could twist. Isn't that what Peter says about those who were reading Paul because they didn't like Paul and they would read Paul and they would twist it to their own destruction, Peter said. Our beloved brother Paul, who in his writings, he writes of things, some things which are hard to be understood, which the unsteady and the untaught are twisting to their own destruction. We don't want to twist any of these words. Why? Because it will possibly lead to our destruction. Now, why would that be? Doesn't the Lord love us all? The Lord loves us all and he guides us with his spirit because he loves us. But if we're not being led by the spirit, but yet we're being led by lies, there has to be a motive within us. And that's due to the fact that we did not, as Jesus say, said, cleanse the inside of the cup. We've got to get to the motive. We've got to understand what are we looking for? Because if we really love our brothers and we love the Lord and we love life, then we'll only pray and seek the truth. But if we're trying to be, maybe we want people to look up to us. And, and so the only way we seem to like throwing contrary ideas out there and people look up to us because there's a lot of individuals in the world that really don't want to be with Christ and have love. And maybe they, they want um, a life of sin. And they want to excuse everything they're doing and, and, and make excuses by saying, well, you know, yeah, I can do all these bad things because, hey, look, I can show you the Bible's probably not even really true or something. There, there's a motive as to why they're not listening when they hear the scriptures say that Lord's coming again and loved one and they don't hear that. But they find a verse and they, they hear something else. 
This is why we have to be very careful about our motives because I believe that the Bible is true. And I believe that the Lord is true. And I believe anyone who seeks him will find. I believe there is a truth. And we'll find the truth if we're sincere. And I believe that the Bible teaches the truth. And I don't think it's contradictory. And I don't think that it teaches that, oh, we're just all going to perish. There is no, you know, Jesus already came. It's done. It's over. It's all spiritual. I remember when I was 18 years old and they disfellowshipped me. And I was devastated. I had no idea at that age. I couldn't even figure out what they were doing to me. I didn't realize they were setting me up and doing this to me. And I remember sitting there in front of an elder that I respected, that I thought was my brother. And I remember he looked at me and said, David, it's like this. You got to lift yourself up by your own bootstraps. And I thought, does he know what he's saying? Because that's impossible. And I thought, you know what? I know in my heart that the Lord loves me. I ain't got to lift myself up nowhere. The Lord will lift me up. Okay, that's what I was thinking. And I knew that I was just a human. That, that sure, I needed, you know, I was sad. I, would, I was confused because my brothers were doing all of this. And yeah, I didn't feel like I was in the best of, 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 of a situation. And yeah, I did need some lifting, right? Some emotional lifting and some brotherly love and some kindness and stuff. Which I knew that my brothers and sisters, whoever they might be, should be doing that and helping me. And he wasn't even willing to do that. And he thought that somehow cleverly that he was giving me some, you know, uh, encouragement by saying that. Maybe he didn't understand what he was saying. But I'll tell you, that really deflated me when he said that. Even though I knew he was ridiculously, he was, I knew he was wrong. I knew the Lord loved me, but at the moment I couldn't, at that young age and, and with everything was going on, I was sad. And it would have been nice had I been sitting there in a, in, in a place where I was loved by my own brother in Christ who, who would have maybe put his arms and said, don't worry about it. We love you. We're not leaving you. We're, we're going to help you. But instead he said, no, you got to do it on your own. It's impossible. So bye-bye, kid. That's kind of the way I felt. So, let's look at 2 John chapter 1. And I'm going to read, starting with verse 4. I'm really trying to get down to about verse 7 and 8. But, starting with verse 4, it says, I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth. See, it's important that we walk in truth. And there is a truth. Okay, there is a real truth and the Bible teaches the truth. And as I said several times now, this is not a video to try and prove that the Bible is true. Hopefully, I hope in my heart that most of you who are watching this already believe that. If not, we'll do videos in the future to try and show you some evidence and help you understand that. But the Apostle John is joy rejoicing greatly that thy children... Who is thy children? He's talking to this lady, right? I believe this he's talking to Mary, Mary Magdalene. But that's a whole nother thing. And verse 5, And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee. Now this is interesting. Why is he talking to some lady? <laughs> and why are the people in the church her children? I think it's pretty interesting. It says, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. The Ten Commandments doesn't say that, no. The Apostle Paul tells us we're not under any of these laws. We're under the laws of Christ. That's why Jesus said, not one jot or tittle of the law will pass until heaven and earth pass away. But heaven and earth will pass away. However, my words will never pass away. My covenant, my commandments will never pass away. The old commandments, the carnal commandments of do this and do that and taste not and touch not and handle not and this and that and the other thing. Uh, tablets of stone that represent your stony heart and this carnal world that's all perishing. But we're under an everlasting new covenant. 
And the commandment is simply to love one another. And the first commandment is to believe upon the name of Jesus Christ. We, we covered that the other day. And the second commandment is to love one another. That as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. Verse 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Verse 9. Whoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not deity. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is a partaker of his evil deeds. Now, Job's Witnesses and other groups have said this is, this is proof that we're supposed to shun people. Well, this is not what it's saying. It's talking about into your fellowship, where you're partaking of one table. Now, when you have this fellowship, when you have people eating at the same table, your children are eating at the table. Your brothers and sisters, your mama, your papa, your, your community, those that you love, and they're eating food. If there's somebody who's trying to kill your children, why would you let him into the meal because he could poison the kids. We're also talking about spiritual meals as well. This is a place of fellowship. We don't just eat food, but we're eating spiritual food together. So when you have a home and you invite people into your home to have a meal, you, this is a spiritual experience. We're not saying that, that you shouldn't go down the road and preach the gospel to everyone. And if somebody needs something, we can go, if they're hungry, we could bring them food. Or if they have no clothes, we could bring them some clothes. Show them the love of Christ. Love your enemies. John's not saying we should shun people. He's simply saying that if there are those who are taking the truth and twisting it like this, it could only be because they did not receive the testimony of the apostles and the Holy Spirit. And they're not seeking for the truth because the Lord provides for everyone to know the truth. And if we're in this reprobate condition where we don't no longer believe in the Lord and we're not keeping his commandments, we're not loving one another. And we're, you know, like there was somebody that the Apostle Paul says was sleeping with his own father's wife or something. You know, it was a terrible situation. He was falling into this state of debauchery. Well, then we wouldn't invite that person into our home. He's sitting there with a bottle of whiskey, you know, slurring his feet, stumbling over the meal and his face down in the food, you know, and our children are watching. We don't have a fellowship with that person in that sense. And when it says, don't even say God's speed, it's saying if somebody's doing an evil deed, we don't say, may the Lord bless you in your, in your evil deeds. We don't say, you know, God's speed to you. Do it quickly. You know, with the Lord's help. No, because they're trying to murder somebody. What we would do is get away. Try to maybe help the person that they're trying to murder, right? And get everybody out of that situation and get away from that person. That's what this is saying. But I got off on that. Because the point here is that this is the teaching of Antichrist. That what? That they don't confess that Jesus has come in the flesh. See, this was a teaching that people had in those days. There were some who believed that Jesus didn't ever really come physically. And therefore, he didn't die for your sins. And he didn't raise up his body that he was literally partaker of flesh and blood as was his brethren. He came and lived and died. That was the gospel. That Jesus came and died upon a cross and died for your sins. And therefore, because of this, we have hope that we'll all be able to be living forever in an immortal body. The resurrection. That he's coming again to receive us. And then we're going to be changed and be like him. 
This is the gospel. And anybody who doesn't believe in this is anti-Christ. And this is very, very, very serious. So, a lot of people might say, oh, I believe Jesus actually, you know, some people believe Jesus literally lived and died. But they think he already came. Well, then that means that what hope do we have? This has already happened and nothing really good happened. We're not living in a kingdom of righteousness. We're not immortal. We're still struggling. There's still death in this world. There's still pain and sorrow. Not every eye saw him. Oh, a couple of people in the desert come out to meet him, but Jesus said, don't believe him because he's coming so that every eye will see him. And I promise you, I guarantee it that Jesus is coming back very soon. Probably within just a couple of three years, a very short time. I believe the Great Tribulation, which will be three and a half years long, is about to happen. Now, it could be a year or two from now when it starts, or even three or four. We do not know the exact moment, but I promise you, the Bible tells us that Jesus is coming back soon. Because we see the events of this world right now happening just the way Jesus described. So, let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, let's start with uh, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto the divine one. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, so it's important that we divide the word of truth. This is the Bible that he's talking about. And his letters were words of admonition. It was the gospel, the word of the truth, the gospel. And we have to, when we're reading these words, we have to rightly divide them. And verse 16, but shun profane and vain babylonians, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom Hymenius and Philetius, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and they overthrow the faith of some. You see, if you teach that the resurrection's already past, that Jesus has already come, when he hasn't, then you are overthrowing the faith of many or at least of some those at least who believe you and many will believe you because they're they're teetering on on confusion and depression and 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 like I was when I was 18 and with dumping on me and throwing me out and then telling me I got to lift myself up by my own bootstraps when I needed my brothers to encourage me See, but we're out there teaching false errors because we don't know what we're talking about. We better be very careful because if we're overthrowing the faith of some, what is going to happen to us? Well, yes, we can repent. As long as there's time, we can repent and we can go back out and tell the people that we, that we harmed and we say, oh, please, no, 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 I was wrong. And we can be a great testimony for the Lord. But the thing about it is, is we, we're, the time is short, brothers. We ain't got no time for this. And, and what if we overthrow the faith of some and they don't ever come back? And verse 19, nevertheless, the foundation of the divine one standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Okay, what iniquity? Well, sharing error with people. You see, if we don't know, if we're not completely convinced of the truth, and we don't know the gospel, that Jesus died and rose again, and is coming, and every eye will see him to establish his kingdom, and to raise up the dead that will be together with him. If you don't know this gospel, then don't teach it. If you're confused and you think maybe Jesus isn't coming, then what you need to do is get on your knees and start praying to the Lord 
to show you his reality. He will if you're sincere. But darn sure don't say, that's it, I'm, I've read a couple of books. You know, I wouldn't even read books. I don't read books. I read the Bible and I pray. Now, I'm not saying don't watch my videos. Hey, you can, you know, I'm trying to encourage you. Right? But in the end, you're going to have to go to the Bible yourself. And get on your knees yourself. And seek the cleansing of your, the inner cup. Your heart. Your motives. Make sure you are motivated that you would know the truth. Now look, sometimes we get to thinking, look, I ain't got no proof of Lord Jesus. I ain't got no proof of nothing. I'm depressed. I don't know what to do. I'm just going to go eat worms. Or I'm just going to start going telling everybody, look, I got doubts. You should have doubts too. Well, guess what? That's not how we do it. If you got doubts, go to the Lord. And when you are fully convinced in the Lord, then you go and help others to find that fullness, that conviction. But if you are sincere, you will find that the Lord is true. And he is good. And he will answer you because I tell you and I give you my testimony. I promise you that if you seek the Lord, he will answer you. He will teach you. He will comfort you. If you seek, you will find. You knock, it will be open. I promise you. But you must truly want to know the truth and not just be a contrarian. So, you see how important this is to teach. I mean, specifically in this particular doctrine, the Bible, no, no other doctrine is the Bible or the New Testament more specific than this. You know, there are lots of little doctrines and things and teachings that, you know, you can get wrong or whatever. But the Apostle John made it very clear, and the Apostle Paul, that anybody who teaches against the Lord Jesus and his coming and his reality and his death and resurrection and his coming again, that is the Antichrist teaching. That is not acceptable. You have fallen in your faith and you are apostate. And... Let us hope and pray that you are not lost. That your heart is just no longer interested in finding the truth. Let us hope that there's still a spark of hope and love inside of you so that you will go into your closet and get on your knees and pray until the Lord answers you. And if he doesn't give you an answer, that's not an answer. You just wait until he does. I want to read also 2 Thessalonians. We, we read this several times. And we've talked about this already in the last few days. But I want to read it again. Verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh yeah, Jesus is coming. And by our gathering together unto him. Oh yeah, we're going to actually gather together unto him. Not just to some good fuzzy feeling in the heart. That ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as though from us. Yeah. Don't listen to Jehovah's Witnesses in their watchtower or they're awake. They write these little letters saying that they're the one, you know, they're us, right? They're the anointed. They're the governing body. They're going to tell you. Oh yeah. Christ already returned in 1914. This is kind of the same thing. He's in the desert. Go out to meet him. Oh, he's in the inner chambers. Don't believe him, Jesus said. When I come, every eye will see me. Everybody will know. It is here. I'm going to set up my kingdom. I love you. I'm real. Touch me. A flesh, a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones. Did you see that I do? I'm real, Thomas. Believe me. My Lord and my deity. And Thomas got down and worshipped him. So don't be troubled or soon shaken in mind or troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there shall come a falling away first. Friends, we're going through the great falling away. We've had many apostasies. There have been many antichrists. But 
there will come a moment in the last moment of time before Christ returns. We read about that and we're going to read about it here again where Paul says the man of sin is going to be revealed. The Antichrist. Everybody's going to worship him and he's, he's going to deceive the whole world. The devil's come down to knowing that he's got a short time to deceive the whole world. And that's happening right now. But let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. Which is what we're going through. They're teaching transgenderism, unthankful, unloyal, unnatural, disobedient to parents, right? All these things that that Paul said would happen. Except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, and the son of perdition, who opposes himself and exalteth himself above all that is called the divine, or that is worship, so that he as the divine being sitteth in the temple of deity. Showing himself that he is deity. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. How did he know these things? He read the book of Daniel. We just did a video on that. Go back and watch the video that we did yesterday. If you do not understand or know anything about this uh, prophecy of how this is all going to pan out and we're in that day right now. And what Jesus meant in Matthew 24 and Luke 21. The wrath upon this people. And Jerusalem shall be trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. That all things might be fulfilled. And then I'm coming on the clouds of heaven. And I'm going to receive you unto myself. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked be revealed. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Oh, see, Dave, he's just coming in some brightness. He's not actually coming. No, the Lord himself shall descend with a shout. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. I'm telling you, friends, get it straight. Get on your knees if you need to, but get this straight. Don't be an antichrist. Even him whose coming is after the working of a Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Of course, that's why you're being drawn off into all these weird teachings. Oh, Jesus isn't coming. Jesus already came. Jesus isn't real. Santos Bonacci says, oh, Jesus is the devil. Same thing. We ain't got no time for that. I love you, brother. Come come back to the fold before it's too late. with all the seemableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved or delivered from the wrath to come that's coming. And for this cause, the divine one shall send them strong delusions that they should believe a lie. Okay, that's the devil. He's coming. He's deceived the whole world, right? But not us. It says even the elect might be deceived. It's possible. But no, it's not possible. Brothers and sisters, if you love the Lord, it's not possible that the devil can deceive you. If you stick to the Lord, you pray and you seek, he won't let it happen. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Well, that just means to be condemned. And we'll be condemned. This is the wrath that's coming The condemnation that's coming, but in Christ there is no condemnation. And we're not appointed under the wrath. Why? Because we're in Jesus Christ and we believe in him and he's coming to save us because we receive the love of the truth that we might be saved. But if you don't, then you stay and you remain under this delusion. A strong delusion. Yeah, it'll be easy to accept the lie if you don't care enough to seek the truth. And verse 13, 13, but we are bound to give thanks always to the divine one for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because the divine one hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and the belief of the truth. Oh, what is the belief of the truth? Well, we just talked about it. The most important belief is the belief that he commanded us to believe in him and to love one another. And that he's coming again because we don't want to have no hope. Believe, Thomas. So believe. 
Stop being an unbeliever. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. And he worshipped him. What will you do? Will you believe? Will you have enough faith to reach out and touch him? Remember the woman who just said, if I could just touch him, I will be healed. Well, if she hadn't have said, I'll just touch him, if she hadn't had faith to walk up and touch him, what does it mean that she decided to touch him? She could have walked away. I don't believe in this. Verse 14. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Brothers, stand fast. Brothers and sisters, stand fast. And hold on to the traditions that you have been shown about the Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 16, Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and the divine, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope. Hope of what? Hope of the resurrection and eternal life. Through grace, not through law, comfort your heart and establish you in every good word and work. So guys, this is the gospel and I really and prayerfully hope that you will all take it seriously. And if there are any of you who have any questions, I'm always here for any serious questions. People who are seeking answers or whatever, I can help you fight. If I can help, I will. And if you know anybody that needs any encouragement and help, please be there and help them. Well, let's get down on our knees and pray and let's seek the Lord. Friends, the time is now and we need to start preparing. It's David Vost. I'm going to go ahead and go. The Lord bless you. We'll see you tomorrow. Have a good one.